This will be the first video lecture of the three that we have coming up over the next week and a half. So today, I want to finish talking about Rocky Shore intertidal. So we have just a little bit left to talk about. And then start talking about coral reefs. Very interesting. A lot of people are interested in coral reefs. Even at URI up here, a long ways away from coral reefs, we have a number of researchers that work on coral reefs at the College of Environment and Life Sciences just hired somebody that had a coral reef expertise and so uh, coral is very important very interesting spend at least one lecture and part of another talking about coral reefs and then you're going to have a lecture in class on Wednesday. We'll be here, but this is going to be on polar seas. And then you're going to have a lecture not on the open ocean, but on continental shelf ecosystems. And then we'll talk about the open ocean. very different kind of habitat, especially in contrast to the coral reef. Okay, so there we change it right as we're going along. This is actually going to be our schedule. And then in the meantime, on uh, Monday the 17th, a couple of weeks, we'll have our sixth quiz. I think we'll probably have one more to try and get people's grades up. Have a, one more additional quiz before the end of the semester. Okay, well, what I wanted to finish up talking about today was the, the uh, intertidal. And of the last of the intertidal, we we're talking about the rocky shore, which is well studied. People are very familiar with this, Rhode Island as well, because there's rocky shores, a lot of places where there's uh, researchers. It's easy to do. You just walk out there, all kinds of things you can do things you can man manipulate. You can spend a lot of time for a little money looking at rocky shore. So there's really a lot known about rocky shore intertidal ecosystems, including zonation and competition and all kinds of different ecological interactions. So we started looking at the rocky intertidal and all we got to was the upper or the, the lower intertidal. That's what we we're looking at. And we saw that there's things that are always uh, underwater, and the ones in the middle, oh, I guess we were looking at the upper inner tidal, saw that there's lichens and some snails and barnacles that are really good at tolerating being out of the water and the other conditions, such as temperature and desiccation, that are associated with that, those that uh, set of environmental circumstances when you're not underwater. In the middle, middle intertidal, you're getting towards the water. It's uh, less important to be able to deal with these environmental extremes, and it becomes more and more important to be able to compete and to deal with predators and all these different species interactions because you're getting closer to the water where it's easy for everybody to live. So some of the things that these middle intertidal organisms have to deal with specifically more so than if you're in the upper intertidal or the lower intertidal. One is wave action because this is really where the waves crash. And so if you look at animals, they've got a mechanism for attaching to the rocks. They've got their morphology as such that it dissipates a lot of the force when waves hit them and things like that. And then you've got algae, which has mechanisms for attaching to the rocks as well and they've got this their stipe is very flexible so that they can move around in the waves and so if, if you can't withstand wave action in the middle rocky intertidal you're gonna have a hard time staying there you're gonna get swept away and you're getting closer to the ocean closer to the water there's only a limited space everybody pretty much has got to be attached to the rocks that's the, the game in town and so there's a 
a fight for space between algae and barnacles and snails and mussels. Everybody's trying to get their little piece of the rocks. And uh, sometimes there's parts of it that are just, they're pretty inhospitable because of the amount of wave action. It's just hard to remain there. Well, there's, there's uh, predators that can make their way there and feed on what's ever there. There's not, nobody's really running away because everybody's sessile and attached to the bottom, attached to the rocks. And so if you get to the middle intertidal, then you're below the barnacles and you get to a point where there's a lot of mussels. Mussels. There's a vast expanses of mussels. You find the mussels do really well competing, attaching to the rocks. And so that's about the only thing you find in some of these the zones in the middle intertidal. If you go up, you know, a, a little more out of the water, then there's a lot of barnacles. This is where you find a lot of sea stars or starfish that are they're not big movers, but they can crawl around. They can attach with their tube feet. They can move and come out and crawl around depending on where the tide is. and the, and the, So they have a pretty good time there in terms of finding prey. There's prey all over the place for them to eat. So if we look at the middle intertidal, then here's some of the things. See these barnacles in the upper part that, that can tolerate desiccation and temperature changes. There's some other barnacles lower down. There's a lot of mussels. And then you get in the water, and uh, that's life is easy there. So that's what we have to look at next, is what is it like down here if you're uh, basically a marine organism all the time, you're out of the water very little. It's a whole different set of circumstances than if you're up here. And so if if you go to uh, Rhode Island, which you guys are going to do, and look at the middle intertidal zone, you see a lot of starfish, you see a lot of barnacles, mussels, a lot of mussels, and you see these brown algae that have a mechanism for attaching to the rocks and flexible remaining in place. So keep an eye out for those things when you're going to the rocky shore on your field trips. Now the lower intertidal, it's, it's getting to the point where you're pretty much underwater, maybe not all the time, but the amount of time that you're exposed is much less and it's easier to deal with the environmental challenges. You don't have to worry about temperature fluctuations as much. You don't have to worry about salinity fluctuations. You don't have to worry about drying out. You don't have to worry about the availability of food being so intermittent because you're underwater a lot more than you're out of the water. And here it's biology. It's not the environmental conditions that dictate who survives and who doesn't, who wins out. It's competition. Competition is fierce. And again, you've got a lot of organisms that are trying to attach to the rocks. The wave action isn't as high so you don't have to worry about that as much. You can be in tide pools, you can be in the water and, and never out of the water and just coming up into the, the tide pools at low tide. So you've got a lot of different kinds of animals, a lot of competition, a lot of different things you find there. And uh, a lot of algae, but you have some other different species like anemones that are underwater a lot of the time and urchins and sea cucumbers underwater fish are, of course are underwater all the time and then you've got these tide pools very every tide pool is different and you've got a tide pool maybe it's not that big you know if you've been to the rocky shore and you're going to go to the rocky shore it's one of the interesting things to look at are these tide pools to see what's in there and sometimes you've got this little tide pool and it rains and it rains and rains and now this tide pool, the salinity of this tide pool has changed drastically. Or maybe it's not raining for a long time. This tide pool is kind of at the upper end of the tide and it's not flushed with, with a wave. And now you've got this tide pool where the water's evaporating, it's evaporating, so it's becoming more and more saline. Those are the kind of, kind of conditions that tide pool organisms have to deal with and it depends on where you are on the rocky shore what kind of tide pool you're going to have but 
there's a lot of interesting things in tide pools. You see a lot of you see fish and you see sea stars and you see anemones and crabs and and uh, they have some mechanism for dealing with these dramatically fluctuating environmental conditions. So you go to the rocky shore and uh, this is what you see. There's uh, predators that can clear off the there's big bands of mussels sometimes at the at the at the top of the lower end of tidal there's a bunch of seaweed it's it's a place where if you can compete and you can deal with the biological challenges then that's where you're going to be that's where you're going to make a living so in Rhode Island you're going to go uh, depends on the tides and the accessibility of the to the water what you can see but there's urchins and there's brittle stars some of these places there's even even uh, sea slugs that you can find nudibranchs this may be what it's like when you're out at the rocky shore on our field trip okay so that concludes the intertidal parts now the coral reef sometimes the tide goes down and parts of the corals are exposed but this is a different kind of ecosystem. So one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. It's three-dimensional, different levels of zonation. There's a huge amount of primary productivity. The coral themselves have these dinoflagellates, which we'll look at, in their tissues, which are photosynthetic, producing a lot of energy. There's a lot of things that feed on the corals. And the corals are also filter feeding they rely on the dinoflagellates for some of their food but there's a lot of zooplankton that floats across coral coral reefs for coral to feed on and not just coral but other filter feeders as well there's a lot of it's very dynamic very productive and if you look in terms of energy density like the amount of energy per unit area it's going to be one of the most productive parts of the ocean anywhere. So we're going to look at these 10 things about corals. People are fascinated with corals. They're beautiful corals underwater and above the water sometimes. So people are really interested in corals. As I said, even here at URI, there's a lot of interest in corals. But they're not around here. There are a ways from here. First, we're going to look at the different types of corals and we're going to see that there's soft corals and there's hard corals there's reef building corals but if you go around the world and you see what the distribution of corals is then it's about 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south that's the band where you find corals there's some places that are farther north for instance you guys that are going to Bermuda Bermuda is about 32 degrees north and yet there's corals there so it's not a like a bound it's not a fixed boundary but if you look at the water within this band of latitudes 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south then it's about 18 degrees celsius or warmer south of 30 degrees and north of 30 degrees south within that band and this is a water temperature that is necessary for the calcium carbonate deposition for these corals especially and you find them along the edge of continents a lot of continents there's uh, extensive reefs the Great Barrier Reef in Australia but around islands there are also a lot of corals and so they're, they're somewhat different from one another whether you've got a a stretch of coral along the shore of a continent or whether you've got a coral that fringes an island. So we'll look at those things as well. They need pretty much they need full strength seawater and corals are pretty sensitive to things. They're sensitive to freshwater input that can kill them. They're sensitive to pollution, turbidity that interferes with the photosynthetic abilities and their filter feeding abilities. And so they're not going to be that deep. There are some species of deep corals and mesophotic reefs that are that are fairly deep. 
But most of these corals, the corals that we're going to spend most of our time talking about, they're relatively shallow. And that makes sense because they've got these zooxanthella dinoflagellates that are photosynthesizing. And what do you need for photosynthesis? Of course, you need light. So let's look at a map of corals around the world. So here's the, our United States. We don't have a whole lot of corals. We've got some in Florida, off of Texas, in the flower, flower gardens, but mostly in Florida. And then over here in Hawaii, there's corals all over the place. And then we've got these Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands and some other U.S. protectorates or territories. Or they belong to the U.S., but we don't have a whole lot of coral here. Here's Bermuda, where some of you are going. See, it's just above it's 32 degrees north. But if you look 30 degrees south and 30 degrees north, that's where all these corals are. A lot of them along the continental shelf of continents and a lot around islands, especially in the Indo-Pacific. So they've got a pretty limited distribution. Maybe somebody would say that's a pretty wide distribution, circumglobal anyway. All right, well, let's look at this idea of primary production because this is unusual in a way because coral are animals. So in terms of primary productivity, in terms of the amount of energy that's available for everybody in this coral reef ecosystem, certainly one of the most productive marine habitats that there is. Maybe in some marsh type of environments, there's a lot more, there's, there's more carbon that's produced, but there's a huge amount of primary productivity. Very diverse, three-dimensional, all kinds of nooks and crannies, and there's some by the surface, there's some behind. There's, there's all kinds of different habitats, all kinds of different, different niches to be filled. So it's very, very complex, very diverse, thousands and thousands of species, which is one of the reasons why people are so interested in conservation of coral reefs because so many species are affected in a negative way if coral reefs are de degraded, which is happening in a lot of places around the world. So these are animals, remember, that are forming an entire ecosystem. A lot of the, the things that we've looked at so far, the different ecosystems, and a lot of the ecosystems we're going to look at, they don't have anything to do with animals. They're just you know, it's the, an estuary, or it's a bunch of rocks, or it's sand, or something like that. But this is a, a an entire ecosystem that's made by animals. We looked at some that were made by plants. If you look at seagrass meadows, and salt marshes, and mangroves. Those are entire ecosystems that are manufactured by plants. But this is a, an ecosystem, a huge ecosystem, that's pretty much made by animals. And so if you look around the coral reef, all these different ecosystems, I think I pointed this out in class one time, that there's, there is a primary producer. There's algae, or there's plants, or there's phytoplankton. And each one of these ecosystems, we focused our, some of our initial attention on who the primary producers were. So you might go to a coral reef and you might say, where are the primary producers? There's not very much algae. There's some, but not a whole lot. There's some phytoplankton, but not that much. A lot more zooplankton. There's no flowering plants. So who is it? Well, it's the zooxanthella, these dinoflagellates that are in the tissues of the coral. So let's look at those primary producers. If you look in a, uh, the tissues of a coral, then in these these corals that have this symbiotic relationship, they have these little protists, dinoflagellates, that are called zooxanthella. It's a little algae, and uh, there's some that these uh, hermatypic corals, they have zooxanthella, but the other ones don't. So there's some that they're not going to grow that quickly if they don't have these zooxanthella. They're not going to get as much energy. So there's these reef building corals that have the photosynthetic dinoflagellates zooxanthella in their tissues. There are a lot of these. Look at the, the density of these. There could be a million zooxanthella per 
square centimeter. That is a lot of zoosanthella. Square centimeters, not very big. So these are photosynthetic. They need light, which uh, explains the depth distribution of these corals. They're going to be someplace where there's exposure to light. And so it's a classic symbiotic relationship. The coral has these tissues that contain zoosanthella. They're embedded in the tissues. And so the corals get a place to live in those tissues. They, they don't have to worry about their, their habitat. And they get nutrients. They get carbon and nitrogen and phosphate or phosphorus. Those are three things that we've looked at in this class a number of times and related those to organic materials and related them to ATP and related them to DNA and RNA and proteins. Those are essential nutrients. And so there, there's a steady supply for the corals or from the uh, for the dinoflagellates, there's a steady supply of nutrients that are produced by the corals. They're wastes of the corals, but for the algae, the zoosanthella, it, it's a good supply of those nutrients. The algae, they're photosynthetic. They're producing oxygen. They're producing food, some kind of sugar that's a product of the photosynthesis. And they produce a lot more carbon, carbon-based food, than, the, than they're using for themselves. That's their down payment. That's their rent, basically, is this extra carbohydrate that the coral can eat. So the coral get a lot of energy, food, basically, from the dinoflagellates. The dinoflagellates get all these nutrients, and they get a home. They're protected. And so it's a very good situation for both parties in this symbiotic relationship. All right, well, let's look at uh, briefly. We're not, we don't need to go into a whole lot of detail about the classification of corals because our interest is more in the different types of corals and the, how this whole ecosystem works, the coral ecosystem. But there's different corals. These are nadaria that we looked at before, the jellyfish, same, same uh, phyla as jellyfish. They're soft, so they're relatively primitive. But there's soft corals, there's sea fans, there's sea pens, and then there's these hard corals, stony corals that, that deposit calcium carbonate. They have skeletons that build the reef. So there's different types. And see, here's the nadarians and some of the things they're related to, jellyfish and, and hydroids and things like that. And then there's a couple of different types. The hard corals are the ones that form these reefs, and the hard corals are the ones that that uh, are so important for this particular ecosystem that we're looking at. A lot more corals in the Pacific, the Indo-Pacific, than there are in the Atlantic. If you look at the number of species, 700 species at least in the Indo-Pacific, which is way more than in the you find in the Atlantic. Okay, so in terms of the structure, if you look at a typical coral. And this is what you find. You've got these polyps. They look like little anemones, kind of. They are nadarians, and they've got the tentacles. And they are animals, so they can filter feed. They're carnivore. They're eating things that they filter out of the water. But again, there's a very large percentage of their energy that comes from the dinoflagellates, from the zoosanthella. They secrete calcium carbonate. And they actually have a skeleton, and so there's an individual coral is going to have a whole bunch of these polyps. And we looked at the polyp and medusa stages of nadarian so quite a while ago. And if you look in the tissue of these polyps, that's where you find the zoosanthella. So these tentacles of the polyps, they're feeding, they're filtering things out of the water, but they. Uh, it only supplies part of their food, and they really need those zoosanthella to be able to get enough energy to survive. But look, here's this: here's a typical coral uh, 
a branch of a coral sticking up here. And in this case, if you look, here's these different individual polyps. And so below the polyp, this is what the polyp is sitting on, is this skeleton. It's calcium carbonate. And this is what grows. The, the uh, polyp dies, and then there's another skeleton on top of that, another one on top of that, another one on top of that. So this coral grows. And if you look at the body of this polyp, then you see these tentacles. And in those tentacles, you have these nematocysts, which should be familiar to you from our survey of the nadarians. And so they're waving these arms around, filter feeding. They can bring their food down into the this central cavity, and they can feed that way. However, as we mentioned a couple of times, they don't get enough food this way, not very many of them anyway, to support themselves. They rely on those zoosanthella. So if you look at, again, and here's branches of coral. If you zoom in and look, you see these individual polyps. And if you look in the tentacles of one of these polyps, this is what you see here, that you've got these stinging cells, but you've got embedded in here are all these little zoosanthella. Thousands and thousands of little zoosanthella. So here's an actual picture of one little tentacle. You can see all these dots are these little algae or dinoflagellates that are photosynthetic. They're embedded in the tissues. And it does work very well. It's a very good relationship for these two species, or these two animals. There's a lot of different species. Okay, well, let's do a brief survey of the types of corals. If you were taking a coral reef ecology class and you'd learn all these things, you'd spend a lot of time and you'd probably be snorkeling or diving or swimming around looking for these different types of corals. But there's a whole bunch of different types, body shapes, basically, or the morphology of these corals that are really related to where they're found on the coral reef. There's some that are really strong, withstand wave action. There's some that are highly branched and a big giant surface area in calm waters for a big surface area for photosynthesis, grow fast. And then there's some that are flat and along the bottom, and it really depends on where you are and what kind of environmental conditions you have to tolerate as a coral. So that's basically the point of of looking at these different coral types. And now we're going to look at them just to give a, an idea, basically, of the diversity of these coral, that they're pretty diverse. But these morphologies, keep in mind, have to do a lot with where they're found and what kind of conditions they experience. So this isn't based on their evolutionary relationships. These are just different types, different morphologies. So you find some of these in different groups that are closely related and some that are in the same group that aren't particularly closely related. So here's a picture showing some of these. There's an encrusting coral and there's a big giant well it's called a massive coral that's what it is it's massive and then you've got this foliace one that looks like a flower and you've got these branching ones highly branched and you've got uh, these columns columnar and you've got these flat things that look kind of like a table and so just in this one picture you can see these first six but let's go through these and we'll look at a number of different examples for each one of these. So the encrusting coral. You see a lot of these out on the coral reef where there it's a flat, thin layer of coral and the polyps are all in here. And it's it's not a particularly big structure and they're flat on these rocks. It's uh you know, you can imagine trying to break part of this off. It's not very easy to go in here and break these off. They're they're pretty sturdy. Very good where there's a lot of wave action. And then there's these massive, they look like boulders, big giant massive corals. And so again, it's a very strong, very sturdy, withstand wave action. They don't grow that fast. These things that don't have a bunch of extensions or big surface areas, they tend not to grow very fast.
So these first two, not really fast growers, they don't have big surface area for photosynthesis. And you've got these foliace ones, foliage, it looks like a flower, where they've got these big petals, analogous to petals, big surface area, which is exposed to sunlight, which provides light for photosynthesis. So they can grow pretty quickly. And then you've got all these branching, look at all these branching ones that they may not, we'll look at some other ones that are branching, but they're particular type of shape, column or a, looks like a, a elk, elk antler. But look at these branches, there's a lot of corals that look like this, sharp, and you can cut yourself on these. And So there's a whole bunch of branches, again, they can grow fairly quickly exposure to light and relatively high level of photosynthesis that takes place with those zooxanthella in the tissues. Here's some more. A couple of these. There's the columnar one. Look, they look like columns. Pretty sturdy. Don't have all those branches. They're not going to grow as fast. Not as much surface area for photosynthesis some place where the waves are going to be coming through here and if they had all these little branches they'd probably be broken off and then you've got this elk horn type coral where these uh, actually these we need to change these numbers to five six seven Eight. Well, that makes more sense. I don't know why they were like that. But here they are. There's uh, So this is a six elk horn. Looks like elk, if you've ever seen an elk, like a big deer. Then they grow fast. Uh, a lot of a area for photosynthesis, but they're pretty sturdy. They don't have all these little fine branches that could break off. And as the waves move through here and the water moves through here, then it's, it's like a tongue and groove type of coral bottom where the, the force of the waves is, is dissipated off to the side through some of these. Then you've got the mushroom coral. It looks like a big mushroom. They're dome-shaped or they're flat, and they're, they're oftentimes you find these out in the middle of a sand patch by themselves. And... Uh, so it's a fairly big surface area. They're not going to be someplace where there's a lot of wave action necessarily. And then you've got these table, big giant surface area for photosynthesis. Not particularly strong. If you had waves breaking on these or strong currents going through here, they could be broken off. So again, you find these in the, the back part of reefs where it's relatively protected. So the point is, there's a, a lot of diversity in the types of corals. These animals, even though they're relatively primitive, they're nadarians, they've got radial symmetry, and they're, they're missing a lot of, of uh, organ systems that higher animals have. There's a lot of diversity of these corals. Okay, well, let's move on to coral growth. This is something people are really interested in because there's a lot of corals have been destroyed, a lot of corals have died, and they're trying to get corals, they're trying to reestablish corals, they're trying to have coral nurseries. So there's a lot of interest in understanding how corals grow and in maximizing the ability of corals to grow to be able to reintroduce corals and replace the, the ones that have died, especially with the uh, global warming and problems with calcification, the ocean acidification, and increased ultraviolet light and coral bleaching has led to a lot of problems. There's big parts of the ocean that have coral reefs that have died off. Well, the secret for corals is to grow up. They've always got to be growing up. If you're growing up in the water, I mean, not just growing up like older, but growing up in, in the direction of the surface because that's where the sun is that's where the sunlight is and so 
they've got this polyp on top of the skeleton, the calcium carbonate skeleton, and they're constantly adding to that skeleton. So they're growing, 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 and we're going to see eventually, especially when we look at uh, islands, not so much around the continents, but especially around islands, they've got to grow at a faster rate than the island is sinking or else they're going to be in trouble. So, they're, uh, sometimes they, they can grow asexually by budding or the branch falls off and they can, they can reproduce that way. They're pretty primitive animals. So they can reproduce asexually, but they also reproduce sexually that we'll look at in a, in, right after this. But uh, there's a lot of things that influence how fast they grow. They need a certain amount of light to, for photosynthesis, for energy to channel towards growth. So if there's uh, currents that are moving through there, then that can keep the water fairly clear can provide some nutrients in order for them to grow. Depth, obviously, is related to the amount of light. The deeper you go, the less light there is. The closer you are to the surface, the more light there is. Turbidity is a bad thing for coral because it blocks light rays. The more turbid the, the water is, then the less light is going to penetrate, and that's a problem, especially with pollution, sedimentation, development, sewage, things like that gets out into the water and it's turbid and then it ends up killing coral. Sedimentation is another thing, natural or from developments, building, you see a lot of building next to the ocean and these big, when it rains, there's a lot of sediment, dirt that's washed out in the water, bad for coral. Temperature influences growth rate and so that's why you find these most places around the world, it's either 18 degrees or warmer. And then day length has to do with the amount of sunlight. You're not going to find these at uh, high latitudes where the t in the winter, the days are very short. So the places where you find coral, the, the days are pretty long and they're pretty consistent. Don't change so much with the season. Okay, well, let's, let's look at this, see if this... Okay, let's see if this thing will play. This is pretty interesting. A coral lava drifts in the open sea, floating in a soup of young reef animals. Just one of these coral larvae settles in a suitable spot and survives, a new reef will be founded. In just a few days, the lava changes form and becomes a polyp similar to a sea anemone. Identical copies bud off and gradually a colony develops. Each polyp surrounds itself with a hard skeleton and from this solid base begins to grow. It increases in length by an impressive 15 centimeters a year. This branching coral is only two years old. A mature reef can be thousands. Corals provide the foundations on which the entire reef community relies. Some organisms, like the Christmas tree worms, actually live within the coral. Others climb out away from the reef to filter their food from the water. <laughs> 
As the community grows, intimate relationships are formed and different creatures become increasingly dependent on one another. Even animals that spend much of their time traveling in the open ocean return to the reef for a clean. Coral reefs can be home to astounding numbers of fish. <laughs> 